Hello, welcome to the June monthly webinar uh, provided to you by Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. My name is Mike Kramer. I am going to be presenting on behalf of uh, PJLA. I am the Calibration um, and Inspection Program Manager at Perry Johnson. And I uh, want to thank you all for, for logging in. Today's topic um, in our series of webinars is uh, sex. We're going to take a look, of course, uh, um, since the standard um, has been revised, the uh, emphasis on the webinars have been looking at the uh, 17025 2017 and interjecting some of the, the um, key differences between the 2005 2017 standard. So today uh, we're going to take a look at section 710, which is non conforming work i.e. in 2005, it was not uh, control of non-conforming testing and calibration work. Uh, 2017, we were just uh, incorporating it all together in uh, section 710 is non-conforming work. And a small section that's uh, within the standards that we're gonna um, tag on to the requirements of 710. We're gonna look at uh, um, 8.6, which is uh, 2017. It's a section on improvements. Okay, uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded and uh, you can go back and uh, listen to the, the webinar um, if you would like to do so, or perhaps uh, you have a colleague that may have missed uh, today's session and uh, feel they might benefit from going back and listening to the recording. Just go to uh, Perry Johnson's website, follow the link uh, to recorded webinars and uh, you'll find uh, them going back several years. So if uh, you, you missed the one uh, last month, uh, want to go back and listen to it, you can still uh, go back. We realize uh, uh, I'm on the East Coast, one o'clock East, East Coast time uh, may not uh, fit everybody's needs as far as being available and being logged in and uh, listening to the webinar live. So hopefully uh, this can, um, uh, help uh, alleviate some of the logistical problems of uh, tuning into the webinars. Um, there should be a box on your webinar um, page. Uh, if you have any questions during the course of the webinar, feel, feel free to type them in there. When we conclude uh, this uh, presentation, I'll go back and, uh, and this is live real time. I'm looking at them directly for the first time at the uh, conclusion of the presentation. Uh, review them and try to answer as many as I can. I just uh, uh, want to request, uh, please keep your questions uh, in regards to today's um, topic. I'm thinking uh, after I conclude my web webinars, uh, I often get requests even during the question sessions for just the actual PowerPoint slides. Uh, we have actually under that same webinar tab, uh, you'll see a, a new tab called um, um, presentate under the presentation. It just has the PowerPoint slides. So there's no need to, to email me directly. Just go to P PJLA's website and uh, the present, like I said before, the recorded versions is going to be there. However, just the actual slides themselves is now um, available on our website. So uh, um, if can go download them from our website, uh, use a presentation, however you um, elect to, to do so. If you want to go over the slides yourself again uh, without the recording um, or go over it with your staff uh, and uh, provide a dialogue yourself, by all means, um, these are uh, the resources available to you all on our uh, Perry Johnson website. So we're going to look into today's topic. We're going to start with section 710, non-conforming work. So um, 
looking at the 2005, we had uh, control of non-conforming testing or calibration work. So uh, we have uh, some changes. It's not a, a significant amount of changes between 2005 and 2017. Overall, the clause is more detailed and a new item has been, in, been uh, included that is to be taken into account in the non-conforming work procedures. And I highlighted these two and uh, we're going to uh, look at them as we go through the requirements. Uh, but uh, we now have risk coming into play here under bullet point B under uh, what your procedure needs to ensure. And a little bit expansion on the evaluation process uh, that now 2017 base basically specifies an impact analysis on previous results. So non-conforming work, let's uh, start uh, looking at uh, exactly what we're referring to. Um, sometimes, especially uh, new labs getting involved in here, they sort of uh, include this under the corrective action protocol. This is a, a different section, different uh, requirements. So non-conforming test or calibration work, that would occur if any aspect of the lab's testing or calibration work or the results of this work do not conform to the organization's own procedures or to the agreed requirement of the customers. Non-conforming work can be identified through customer complaints, quality control, i.e. things like control charts, uh, instrument calibration, checking of consumable materials, staff observations or supervision uh, test reports and calibration reports, checking management reviews, and or internal and external uh, audits. These are all sources which could uncover uh, non-conforming work and um, hence would an uh, uh, organization would be uh, looking at uh, implementing these requirements. So a non-conforming is a uh, non-conformance is a deviation from an established protocol or plan, such as examples would include a failure of resources, uh, i.e., resources, personnel, equipment, facilities, work instructions to meet performance requirements or other specified requirements. Failure of personnel to comply with documented work instructions or operational procedures. Failure of past test data to meet required standards due to such things as failure to meet all conditions necessary to ensure the integrity and the representations of the sample, sample history, deficiencies exist, or failure or suspected failures to comply with the test methods, your SOPs, Failure or suspected failures in method performance is demonstrated by results provided by quality control samples or inherent properties of a sample that comprises the testing, such as uh, verified by the methods of the uh, standards additions. Here is, a, I would say, probably um, on my behalf as an assessor, uh, this is an area here where I will find where this procedure needs to be implemented. So this is when you send your standards out, your equipment, excuse me, your standards or your equipment out for calibration, and you have that as found data, and you're coming back with uh, instrumentation uh, here's an example actually on the screen now of uh, actual analytical type test weights where we can see we have the edge found as left conditions and we have some indication of some failures on here. Um, if uh, the edge found is a uh, when a laboratory uh, receives an instrument or a artifact such as a test weight uh, that's uh, where they found it when it comes into the lab prior to any sort of adjustment, cleaning, anything that the lab does 
to alter the value. So when I say this is an area that uh, non-conforming work would fall under, as found, I like to refer to also as as used. So in this particular example, um, what, uh, if you look at, uh, say, the five gram weight, for example, uh, that's how the, the um, organization that was using this particular artifact uh, was using. They were using an out of tolerance test weight. So um, hence uh, could adversely affect the uh, calibration reports or testing reports that that weight was utilized in. So and on a side note here, um, with um, as found failures, uh, this is something that should be caught actually, um, if you recall in the purchasing procedure or ex externally provided um, products and services in section, excuse me, in the 2017, which it is now referred to. Uh, when these items come in, you're supposed to inspect them. Uh, with a calibration, that is the actual report. So, i.e., when those reports come in, uh, those as found failures um, should be subjected to our topic of today, um, 710 non-conforming calibration or testing work being followed. So we're going to look at the, uh, the different clauses now here in section 710. 710.1, the laboratory shall have a procedure. So again, something that tells the organization how um, this is done within the organization. The procedure that shall be implemented when any aspect of the laboratory activities or results of this work do not conform to its own procedures or the agreed requirements of the customers. Equipment or environmental conditions are out of specified limits. Results of monitoring fails to meet specified criteria, for example. Uh, the procedure shall ensure that, well, point one, you have a procedure. A procedure has to ensure that the responsibilities and authorities for the management of non-conforming work are defined. At an event, not, uh, um, say the weight example, determine this uh, protocol needs to be followed, of course, uh, needs to be defined within the procedure of the authorities uh, who has the responsibilities during the, the various um, uh, cycle of the uh, non-conforming calibration work protocol being followed. Uh, procedure shall ensure that B, actions including halting or repeating of work and withholding of work as necessary, and this is in addition, are based upon the risk levels established by the laboratory. So um, risk, of course, section A5 is a new section within the 17025 standard uh, that's brought out specifically, uh, again, within the protocol and the requirements established in 7710. So what, what are we saying here? Um, after considered R, excuse me, our risk. Uh, so uh, the laboratory should adapt. If you have a procedure right now, written in 2000 and to comply with 2005, the laboratory should adapt this procedure for non-conforming work, handling to include different levels of risk. And I would say with the most severe, having direct adverse effect on the customer reported results. So in other words, uh, the bottom line is the, the end product that you've produced uh, um, that, uh, when a non-conforming work has occurred would be the impact on your customer's report. Um, you have to uh, assign it a risk level. And I just have some examples here. Uh, um, that could be uh, perhaps documented in your uh, procedure uh, in regards to risk level. And I just feel that the uh, uh, probably the most severe type risk would be those where it's been determined that uh, this may very likely have an adverse effect on uh, those results that uh, was reported to the customer. Uh, 
have listed here things such as acceptable risk, tolerable, undesirable, intolerable, medium, low, high, moderate, excuse me, moderate, high, uh, maximum. And then hence from there, the laboratory should determine uh, what actions they uh, uh, need to follow. The, the, excuse me, the procedure shall ensure that, C, an evaluation is made of the significance of the non-conforming work. That's, that is nothing new. However, it's been expanded. And uh, I used to feel uh, before, even with 2005, that it, it goes without say. And however, it's uh, documented now in uh, 2017, including an impact analysis on the previous results. Hence, going back to the example on the, uh, not the um, out of tolerance condition of the test weights, uh, basically um, that was an out of tolerance condition. Uh, when was that weight determined last to be within tolerance? Uh, unless there was an intermediate check or something in place, there's no way of really telling when it went out of, out of tolerance. Um, hence, uh, like to use the term reverse traceability. That anti-tolerance condition would need to be evaluated on every test result in which, in that previous example, those test weights were used from. And did it actually impact the result? It may or may not, but an evaluation needs to be made. For example, did the anti-tolerance condition impact statements of compliance reported to customers? A record would need to be created to show that this investigation was performed. What we're saying there is uh, you're reporting to your customers pass, fail, intolerance, out of tolerance. What a, a uh, not conforming work that's been uncovered, or in our example, the out of, the out of tolerance condition of that test weight, uh, would that actually impact that uh, statement of compliance? The procedure shall ensure that B, a decision is, excuse me, a decision is taken on the acceptability of the non-conforming work, i.e. we did the uh, um, impact analysis, we did the reverse traceability or or, or uh, whatever uh, process we needed to go through to uh, determine the effect that the non-conforming work had on the customer's report. And a decision needs to be made as far as whether or not uh, it impacted and we could accept it or not. And then finally, uh, well, still continuing with the procedure, what it needs to ensure is the bottom line is E, the worst case scenario, uh, where necessary, the customer is notified and work is recalled. So in other words, we did our impact analysis. There's a clear indication that perhaps uh, uh, the non-conforming work actually adversely affected our, and um, excuse me, affected the uh, reports that were issued to the customer. Uh, the protocol established, uh, and this is nothing new. This was also specified in 2005. You have to notify the customer and um, recall those reports um, if need be. The procedure shall ensure that the responsibility for uh, authorizing the resumption of work is defined. Somewhere along the line, um, let's say you have, uh, uh, what I have depicted here is a control chart and you have checks on your measurement system and the system was determined uh, that it was uh, out of control and uh, correction was taken perhaps to have the equipment uh, serviced, uh, perhaps uh, adverse environmental conditions uh, were improved, uh, control charts were reestablished, rechecked, and uh, was determined to be now within a state of statistical control. Uh, somebody uh, has to have the responsibility for authorizing, okay, we can proceed with the, with the work. 
are specified in here, excuse me, in the 2017 standard, uh, authorizing the resumption of work is defined. Have to, have to um, identify, and this is what the procedure needs to assure who that individual is that would uh, authorize the resumption of work. Um, once a non-conforming uh, testing or calibration work has been determined to occur and it's been rectified and been determined, it's uh, been uh, corrected and and somebody has to be assigned for authorizing the resumption of work. Okay, uh, so we just went through 7101. You have to have a procedure. And we went through all the bulleted, out, bulleted items that the procedure had to ensure. So, um, 7102 states uh, you have to follow that procedure and you have to have records. So, 7102, the laboratory shall retain records of non conforming work and actions is specified in 7101. All those bulleted items B through F. So um, I have actually done assessments. And when I look at, uh, for traceability purposes, I'm looking at calibration reports, for example, and I see something that's significantly out of tolerance. I wanna see a record uh, that um, fall into place with the requirement specified 7102. I've had heard, I have seen no record produced, however, verbal explanation. Yes, we know that device was um defective and we took it out of service for example if that was a case uh a record uh, should be established to basically show that this was removed at this point in time and it has not impacted everything any excuse me work since this uh, condition was um, noted so basically a non-conforming report report um if you like to call it that uh, just needs to show as I state when I talk about record, a record shows what's been done. So uh, 7101, we talked about the, pr the procedure, which shows how it's done. 7102 is stating the records have to be established to show what's been done. Seven ten three. Where the evaluation indicates that the non-conforming work uh, could reoccur or that there is doubt about the conformity of the laboratory operations with its own management system, the laboratory shall implement corrective action. So in other words, uh, we have to uh, um, go look at section 8.7, which is a corrective action. That procedure would need to be implicated. Uh, Therefore, uh, establishing the causes of the non-conforming work, uh, looking at that recall, basically, excuse me, that the, um, the causes or root calls and uh, per doing the uh, corrective action procedure and preventing it from reoccurrence. So basically, 7.10.3 is stating, this is not something that uh, determines it could possibly uh, reoccur. Uh, the lab should take corrective action and implement the, the protocol established in Section 87, which is the uh, procedure for corrective action. Okay, that's um, the end of the, the, se the um, session on nonconforming work. Uh, we're going to cover now, we're going to look at uh, Section 86, which is a uh, short session, uh, excuse me, section within the standard. So uh, overall, uh, this uh, section has been reduced. So we have what, uh, what was documented in the 2005 standard and 861, uh, Section 86 is a section on improvements. Uh, 861, excuse me, 861 is the... Uh, Call it the counterpart of 2005. If you look at the clause on the top from 2005, 2017, the laboratory shall identify and select opportunities for improvement and implement 
any necessary actions. So if you look at those items in 2005, we can see here on the next slide, though, that they are now captured in notes. So opportunities for improvement can be identified through the review of operational procedures, the use of policies, overall objectives, audit results, corrective actions, management reviews, suggest, excuse me, suggestions from personnel, risk assessment, analysis of data, and proficiency testing results. So notes uh, within the standard, uh, they're provided uh, to give clarification of the text and guidance. They do not contain any actual requirements. So that's the same as in 2005, there are notes within the 2017 standard. So those areas given in the notes above, if you look at those areas uh, that specify, these all are um, incorporated into the 2017 standard. We have requirements for man. We have to do management review. There's requirements for that. Uh, we have to do risk management. Uh, we have to do corrective action. We have to do internal audits. So when I look at this, um, yes, we have to do it. So ideally, under this section 8.6, uh, besides meeting the requirement uh, specified in the standard, um, ideally, uh, they will provide benefits to the organization that provide can provide opportunities which can be identified. Okay, customer feedback. Uh, formerly, uh, this was, and it's nothing new here. This was in 2005, uh, had a separate section though called service to the customer in 2005, section 4.7. So uh, the laboratory shall seek feedback, both positive, and I've highlighted shall, uh, shall as a, is a requirement. So whenever you see that word shall within the standard, that is a requirement, uh, shall seek feedback. So you have to actively seek feedback, both positive and negative from its customers. The feedback, again, I highlight shall shall be analyzed and used to improve the management system, laboratory activities, and customer services. So a note here gives samples of uh, types of customer uh, feedback. So again, the lab has to actually seek feedback, nothing new there. Uh, the note includes things like uh, satisfaction surveys, uh, communication records, and review reports with customers. So uh, looking back at 862, the feedback shall be analyzed. So uh, in determining uh, how you're gonna seek feedback, and I would say even uh, way back when I was first presented this, the first thing that came to mind with customer was sending out customer surveys. And I've been doing assessments uh, for, for quite a few years, and I've heard this in more than one occasion We've sent out, uh, oh, let's say several hundred surveys. We only get three or four back. Um, that's the case. Yes, the lab is seeking feedback, but it's not being uh, actually used as a vehicle that can be uh, analyzed for improvement uh, within the management system. As I would say, a situation if an organization is doing doing that, yes, they're fulfilling the requirement of the doc of the excuse me of the standard uh, seeking feedback, but uh, the feedback is actually not providing any benefit. If you're doing the surveys, you're not getting them back. Um, there are other alternatives to seeking feedback. Uh, could maintain, uh, perhaps there's some examples here in the notes. And I've had conversations after I've heard that before in laboratories. And uh, in the course of the conversation, perhaps uh, direct, uh, reaching out directly with your customer. Uh, let's say shortly um, after, uh, oh, you're doing an on-site calibration, uh, shortly after your technician left, um, you've recently just sent them a test reports, perhaps reaching out directly and maintaining a call list. You've got your uh, test reports, you got your calibration reports, uh, just wanted to make sure you didn't have any questions, um, basically uh, identify things you would want to know, and then um, use that as a vehicle to, 
for uh, receiving feedback. And what I'm trying to get at here, yes, you have to seek feedback, but it, it also needs to be analyzed. And it's actually a, a topic for the, uh, an input for the management review. So I've seen management review, customer surveys. We've sent out customer surveys. They're not really being able to analyze it in, uh, in that aspect. Yep, you took it into account, but there's no way to analyze it uh, as a way to improve the management system. Okay, that's uh, going to uh, conclude the presentation from today's webinar. And uh, as I stated when I started the uh, presentation, if you have any questions, and I think uh, just from doing this, we've started doing this a couple months ago. Sometimes it takes a, takes a little while for my box to populate. So if you have any questions pertaining to the topics that we just went over, 710 or 86, uh, go, go ahead and type them into your uh, box there provided on your webinar screen. Right now my box is empty, so uh, I know I said that before, I think it was last month, and then I got a slew of questions just appear all at once. So I'm gonna uh, pipe down here a little bit and see if I get any uh, questions come in here. Okay, um, I have a couple of folks that saying the presentation was very informative and I'm glad to hear that because that's my goal. And uh, hopefully I was uh, very informative and you don't have questions. I have a, a Victor is, is saying that uh, he has a question, but I don't see any question being asked. Uh, so um, I'll give it a couple more, I'll give it another minute here, but uh, uh, I am getting some feedback, that, but not in the way of questions. An interesting question here. Uh, what is the difference between nonconforming work and nonconformity? Uh, nonconformity is, uh, I would say, uh, you're not in compliance uh, with, uh, let's say, you're not in compliance with the standard. Um, you're not in require. You're not in compliance um, to uh, with the uh, um, your own quality management system. Non-conforming calibration work, excuse me, excuse me, I am the calibration program manager. Um, uh, calibration or testing or sampling, which 17025-2017 is uh, um, covers, uh, would be anything that was done out of the, say, the testing protocol 
It could be anything such as, uh, oh, doing your testing and when it was outside of predefined environmental conditions. So uh, basically that's what non-conforming work is, which can bring forth a non-conformity. So yes, they can be used, inter if thinking about it, they can be used interchangeably. Hence, if you have a non-conformance, uh, uh, something that could reoccur, then uh, just like with any sort of non-conformance, you would follow the protocol in corrective action. So I would say, in thinking about it, uh, they could be used interchangeably. It has to do with a laboratory not following its procedure, its set protocol, um, not following its own requirements. And uh, a, a non-conforming work could uh, institute a, uh, a non-conformance. Do we need to have a log of non-conforming work? You need to, uh, if you recall um, the bullet point we talked about records. So you just need to, when non-conforming work, when you need needs to be implemented and that procedure uh, needs to be followed, you need to capture the records, be it in a log or a non-conforming report. You just have to capture what's those elements within the procedure. All right, I'm getting a lot of questions now. That's what I was sort of wondering. Um, sometimes it takes a while to, to um, uh, populate. Somebody needs to get some feedback here and thank you. Um, I do have people at the, actually our headquarters condition I, at our location um, that's uh, also listening with us. I cannot see exactly what you see on your screen. Um, somebody's just giving me some feedback. It's hard to see where to type in the questions. Uh, so uh, um, I have a young lady on online with me. So uh, just pass that on, on to her that the, uh, perhaps we need to magnify that some. Not sure what we're going here. And I, um, fella here says, uh, sorry. Uh, says uh, they work for a state lab. I work for a state lab as well. I'm just saying you're involved in uh, feed and fertilizer. I used to be involved in the uh, uh, seed lab in the state that I was uh, employed with in the Department of Agriculture. Um, I work for a state lab. We check bags guaranteed in the feed fertilizer. And I can sort of relate with that with the seeds. Uh, we had field inspectors go out and take them. We also had folks that would bring them in, uh, want to know if their seeds would grow. We have field inspectors who pull samples, okay, from the store, but occasionally we have farmers who will send in a feed, feed sample for testing. They are considered a customer since we charge them a fee for this service. Does this only apply to private labs? Not sure, I hope I'm hitting, uh, getting the gist of the question here. Uh, not conforming work, once that sample comes in, you're going to follow your, um, your protocol uh, for testing that the, uh, excuse me, I'm saying seeds in this situation, it could be fertilizer or feed. You would follow your protocol for testing that regardless of who brings it in. If you recall, uh, I did a presentation on reporting the results on your sampling. The only difference if uh, an organization other than your if a customer is bringing in a sample and they're not following a sampling protocol that's been established, then uh, we're sort of getting off by the topic of today, but on the test reports, uh, it's uh, um, specified that uh, 
they are to be, be recorded as as received. So in other words, you as a laboratory, you don't know how they gathered that particular fertilizer if they followed any sort of protocol. The report just needs to state they were tested as received. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me. Does this apply to private labs? Uh, anybody who is complying with 17025 be an accreditation or basically making statements that they comply with, be it uh, public or private, then yes, they have to comply with it. Are the trend analysis of the items mentioned in the note are required as evidence for the implementation of the clause improvements? Uh, I said notes are for additional information. They are not required. Um, of course, they can be uh, trend analysis. Let's say uh, control charts, um, which uh, if you're, uh, oh, that the um, direct correlation, let's say, between those repeated readings um, will correlate into the uncertainty of that measurement, uh, for example. It could be uh, if, if that's determined to be too sporadic, too great, the standard deviation is, is uh, could be improved upon. So as far as being required, uh, no, but that can definitely be a uh, vehicle which uh, improvements can be detected and made. Perhaps, uh, oh, uh, improvements to the environmental conditions uh, um, that the tester calibrations were being undertaken and then going back, looking at those trend analysis and seeing, say, for example, if the uh, standard deviation has uh, decreased, hence uh, improving the laboratory's reporting uh, of the uh, uncertainty in which repeatability is a component of. Okay, bear with me as I scroll down and said this is real time, so sometimes it takes me a second to digest these questions. And this one here is totally up, I mean, I don't want to say exactly what you should be putting on a survey. Uh, you have to analyze it. Uh, what questions would be on a survey for a calibration service? that can be analyzed as a positive or negative feedback. Uh, I think you have to analyze it uh, when you do a survey. So ideally, you have some sort of measurable on there. Uh, for example, were you able to understand the report uh, numerically? One being they didn't understand it at all, very poor. Say five being excellent. Uh, um no uh no um negativity at all in regards to reporting the results so you need to be able to analyze the results i think uh, if you can do it in a manner of things that are important to you uh customer customer feedback 17025 uh put aside any uh private organization uh i think uh that should be a priority uh, here and what your customers want to uh, tell you. Of course, you want the uh, customers to return, for, uh, to uh, return. But uh, any way you could sort of project some sort of measurable, you can have a goal. We want to, if you have a grading system, you go one through ten, that we want to achieve nine point five or better. Uh, where you can go back and perhaps, uh, and at PJLA we uh, are also. Uh, assessed to a standard 17011. Um, we provide our customers surveys. So those of you all that were accredited by us, and I just got back uh, last night from a, doing an assessment, I left the customer a survey, various elements are, are captured and they're graded. And I can tell you during our management review, we analyze them. We see uh, how we're doing overall and if there's any specific uh, areas we need to look at and need to make improvements on.
what does acceptability of, I guess that's a non-conforming work, uh, uh, exactly mean? Is it to be uh, determined after correction? The acceptance of non-conformance was, uh, I gave the example of uh, non-conforming work. I go back to that test weight. Uh, that was out of tolerance. Uh, you did the impact study and you determined it was so far minutely out of tolerance that it did not impact uh, our uh, statement of compliances that we gave to our customers. Then you just have to show that the investigation has been done and has been determined uh, uh, what actions to be taken and all that protocol was established and whether or not the non-conforming work could be uh, uh, you've established a risk level and um, whether or not it's been established. So I would I would say in this particular case, uh, if it could be accepted would be whether or not it actually impacted the the uh, the, uh, the reports that were produced. And did it to be determined after the correction? No, it would be anything that was done before the correction, anything that uh, did not conforming work when it was performed that it actually impacted. That's what you're looking at. You're going to take correction. You're going to put a Band-Aid on it, fix it at that point in time, and then you're going to take corrective action uh, if it can, could be something that could reoccur and uh, um, assure that it's uh, the likelihood of it reoccurring would be greatly diminished. Not sure I, I understand. It has to talk about risk level, and it, it says how how do you best justify risk level? And what you saw on that slide was uh, that was my dissertation there. Yes, you have to take into the the account the the uh, the risk level. You have to assign it. And what I stated there was what is the risk of it actually impacting the customer's report as the benchmark and establishing that risk level. With, with your own situation, that was what I would feel would be foremost and forefront, but uh, you and establishing your protocol and if you have a procedure, now you need to adopt it to ensure that this requirement concerning the risk level is now captured. You can, uh, can make your own determination on that, but I, I feel that the uh, primarily, primarily, when we're looking at the, the risk level, we need to look at the impact of the uh, uh, reports that we produ produced or um, that's been done that's impacted the work that the lab has already done. You can have all face here, uh, corrective action. Uh, Form. Do you have any suggestions or examples for a corrective action form? Um, I would say just go to the protocol for corrective action and establish a, uh, a form uh, that uh, for your organization to adapt to. So basically with corrective action and non-conformance has occurred, of course you want to state what that is. Um, you want to uh, establish various causes that uh, um, that uh, could have possibly uh, presented the uh, non-conformance that uh, instituted the corrective action was taken. You want to take the corrective action most likely to uh, um, eliminate the root cause and the causes. And then you want to monitor. You want to go back and find this, uh, uh, determine whether the corrective action was taken that was effective. I would say if you're, you're new here, uh, um, looking to comply with 17025, Look at the section on uh, corrective action and go through all those requirements and develop a form where you're going to, to be assured to uh, uh, capture all the required elements within 17025.
bear with me. Um, Some of these I'm having a little hard, uh, could be some, some language barriers here. There's literally folks all around the world uh, trying to uh, understand what the question is. A6, uh, it's asking, you know, A6 is a broad requirement that the laboratory shall identify and select opportunities for improvement and implementation of necessary actions. Um, what, what type of objective evidence am I looking at? And the one that comes to mind for in the forefront is being captured during the management review. Uh, if you heard me give my presentation on management review and internal audits, internal audits, you're looking for compliance on a management review. You're um, looking for uh, opportunities for improvement. So I gave the example of customer feedback, for example. Um, yes, if you uh, put in your management review, you sent out the surveys, um, you took the input, but it's really not presenting any, uh, analyzing or presenting any opportunities for improvement. So I'd be, uh, all those elements or elements, if you look at them, they're in the notes there or things that you do anyway for complying with, and then you sort of uh, look and see what's been done and look for opportunities for improvement during the management review. I would say the management review would be the best uh, source of objective evidence uh, uh, for compliance to section 861. Seven ten one b must be an actual risk matrix. Uh, he stated in the policy or did the lab have the flexibility to determine that after the event? Um, your procedure needs to ensure that um, if you, we go back to section eight, five under risk, and there's a lot of notes in risk, uh, based thinking section eight, five, um, yeah, there's a lots of methods, folks write uh, books on uh, risk analysis, but um, it's up to, it basically gives the lab the flexibility to determine, you know, what approach has been, been done if they want to adapt the, uh, uh, something like a SWOT analysis, for example, um, or they want to uh, create their own, but just have to have a record that it's being done. And in uh, A5 specifies that uh, the lab determines uh, what risk or opportunities that they need to, to look at, but it's very specific under nine conforming work that you need to evaluate the risk. So uh, I gave the example the, of, uh, oh, how to uh, establish risk levels. Uh, your procedure, you need to ensure that's been, been established. If you want to expand on that in your own internal procedure, uh, that would be fine. However, recall that a record's been, you have to establish, excuse me, have to create a record. So if you want to do it after the fact and your procedure is uh, uh, reflective of that, then of course you can establish that after the fact. Uh, another one here. I'm, I'm glad that the, uh, some of y'all find the webinar very uh, informative. And I think that's uh, going to be the uh, end of the questions here. So uh, a lot of questions there, and I guess I, I think it just takes a some time to populate my box here. Uh, you, you all would know better on your on your end when you type the question in because uh, I had to go to sign up for a, a little time there before the uh, questions actually uh, came through. 
But uh, before we end, I just wanted to, uh, well, thank everybody for logging in. And now I'm having some technical difficulties here. There we go. Uh, and to uh, uh, inform you that our, our next webinar will be scheduled for Thursday, July 25th, same time, 1 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. We're going to look at Section 5. That's uh, the structural requirements of 17025. So uh, thank you all for uh, signing in. Uh, mark the date. And, uh, and if anybody wants any slides for today's presentation, you do not need to email me. Just go directly to our website under the webinar, under the webinar tab. Again, the whole recorded, ver uh, excuse me, the whole recorded uh, webinar is available. But if you just want the slides, you can uh, just uh, get the, the blank slides without the recording. So uh, thank you again. Uh, it looks like we had real good attendance here. And I uh, look forward to uh, presenting again on the uh, 25th of July.